My immediate thoughts after the attacks um, were that we are at war, that this is our, you know, Pearl Harbor of our generation. Um, at the very beginning, we needed to find out who exactly was behind the attacks. That's first. And second, we need to do whatever to disrupt any further attacks. Um, at that time, um, I was in Yemen working on the USS Cole investigation. Um, my team made the connection with Al-Qaeda uh, following an interrogation with Osama bin Laden's personal bodyguard, a guy by the name of Abu Jindal. Uh, we found out that seven Al-Qaeda members from photos that we had in our investigations were all on the planes. We knew then that uh, was the very first evidence uh, linking Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda uh, to the attacks of September 11. Uh, the mission <clears throat> immediately became to find those responsible and to destroy their networks and their infrastructure. So getting intelligence uh, for our troops before they invade Afghanistan and walking and, uh, you know, in the footsteps of a lot of the uh, previous great um, you know, officers and agents who worked Al Qaeda before, uh, we were trying to prevent another attack from occurring. Uh, those were the two priorities. It was such a difficult situation. Here we are far away from home. We have no idea what was going um, on in New York. Uh, at the time, we thought many of our colleagues uh, perish, perished in the World Trade Center and died. Uh, at the time, people were saying there is probably 50,000 people who were killed um, in, uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, it was a very difficult time, um, but we got our instructions um, and we needed to find out uh, who was behind that attack. We needed evidence that our government can take to allies, to countries around the world and saying this is the harsh, hard evidence that Bin Laden and Al Qaeda were behind 9-11. And we were able to obtain that. Um, it was such a difficult time. Um, uh, so many emotions, so many raw feelings that we still have until today. Um, you know, I still have personally until today. 9-11 uh, for me is an event that did not happen 20 years ago. It just happened yesterday. And every time you talk about it, you remember uh, these things that you experienced firsthand. But you remember also um, that determination uh, that um, we had as a team to um, you know, continue with the mission, to find out who was behind the attacks, to identify uh, individuals who were directly connecting to the plot, to get the intelligence that we needed in order to go to Afghanistan and in order to destroy the infrastructure of Al Qaeda. Um, it was it was a difficult moment. It's uh, the emotions were uh, so overwhelming at the time, but also the sense of um, rising up to the occasion and, um, you know, doing what uh, the American people expected us to do. Al-Qaeda's core uh, has been weakened after a period of um, high leadership attrition, uh, but its regional affiliates worldwide still pose a threat, particularly uh, the Yemen-based Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula, Shabaab in Somalia, uh, various groups in the Sahel region in West Africa. And uh, jihadis now are even opening new fronts in part of Central Africa, like in Mozambique uh, and the DRC. Al-Qaeda has evolved considerably over the last 20 years or so, yet it remains very dangerous. Uh, the network uh, today is like a hydra, a serpent with many heads. Uh, it is more geographically dispersed. Um, it has branches all over the Muslim world, whereas on 9-11, uh, 
uh, it was mainly relegated to operating in and around the Taliban controlled territories in Afghanistan. Uh, the group today is focused on legal uh, on uh, local issues um, throughout its branches and affiliates and franchises, uh, but that focus could change. Al Qaeda continues uh, to have international aspiration. Make no mistake about it. So just because today's Al Qaeda um, haven't targeted the U.S. Uh, or the West does not mean that cannot change. We cannot get stuck in a conventional mindset. We cannot have a failure of imagination again. Unfortunately, we continue sometimes to repeat past mistakes at a great peril. The conditions that gave rise to the September 11 attacks are resurfacing uh, in places uh, like Iraq, uh, like Syria, like the Sahel, and now definitely in Afghanistan, which will allow groups like Al Qaeda to grow in strength. Uh, we've also failed so far to deal with the ideology. Uh, the next attack won't be something we did not predict, but likely the manifestation of something we did not learn from in the past or we are not effectively addressing today. Let's take example, uh, Afghanistan, for example. The withdrawal of the US troops from Afghanistan certainly uh, provide an opportunity, uh, provide an opportunity for Al Qaeda uh, to regrow its capabilities, uh, to regrow its operation uh, within the country. Uh, if Afghanistan once again descends into civil war, if Afghanistan um, become uh, like it used to be before, uh, most probably it will again be a magnet uh, for foreign fighters from the region and from beyond. So frankly, back to square one. I spent years um, tracking, analyzing, and trying to understand and disrupt terrorist groups and organizations. And today I see many similarities between the rise of uh, global Salafi jihadist ideologies in the 80s and 90s and the rise of global white supremacist ideology in recent years. Um, what most surprised me is how we can overlook uh, the parallels between the rise of these two movements how we cannot learn the lessons. Um, over two decades uh, of the war on terror, we completely, completely and totally overlooked the threats to the homeland from within. And we uh, have not heeded uh, any of the lessons uh, about the rise of domestic threats and uh, the threats that these kind of uh, groups pose to our society. So our current uh, counterterrorism framework uh, was set up in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 to deal almost exclusively with foreign terrorist groups, groups like Al-Qaeda. Uh, but our threat landscape um, has changed, and so too must our thinking uh, and our response. I would draw um, uh, attention to three key areas that's shaping the terrorism landscape right now. And it will continue to shape it, I believe, in the foreseeable future. First, the enduring threat from Salafi jihadi inspired terrorism. Second, the rising threat from anti-government violent groups and racially or ethnically motivated uh, violent extremists. And three, the prevalence of conspiracy theories and disinformation online and the corresponding effects offline. Now we see a lot of people trying to make this, um, you know, false uh, dichotomy between counterterrorism and great power competition. Uh, I think the United States um, can and must do both. Uh, there are significant areas of overlap and conversions between counterterrorism and between uh, great power competition, including, for example, with the Iranian sponsored proxy groups. You have the Houthi in Yemen, Lebanese Hezbollah, you have Hamas, you have the Shia militias in Iraq, the Russians assistant to separatists in the eastern Ukraine. What we are seeing more and more uh, is a violence by, conducted by non-state actors. We, in some places they are terrorists and other they are insurgents or militias. 
And they are using sophisticated weaponry and technology supplied by state actors who also provide tacit knowledge transfer through hands-on training. Uh, also, let's keep in mind that the threat from both the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, um, now they are operating in various regions, that threat remains potent. The U.S. Uh, will continue to require the capacity to retain counterterrorism capabilities and partnerships with reasonable proximity to these areas uh, that, that have a threat. We always think that terrorist groups have a timeline. They don't. We create these timelines and start focusing on them, even though they mean nothing to groups like the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Uh, they are not working on a timeline. They are working to accomplish their mission. And they see, if you look at the map today, if you look at the situation in Sahel, in Mali, in West Africa, if you look at Yemen, if you look at Libya, if you look at Chad, if you look at uh, what's happening in Syria, if you look at Iraq, and yes, if you look at Afghanistan, um, you, they're going to see that they're going to see themselves winning. Uh, their strategy shift, uh, they are like a snake, like a serpent. It's shifted from place to place. The threat is still there. I believe the threat is probably more dangerous today than it used to be in 1996 or 1998 when bin Laden started operating in Afghanistan. Uh, we have a lot of things that we need to be careful about, and yes, we're pulling out of Afghanistan, but we need a safety net. We need a plan B to contain that threat in Afghanistan and prevent Al-Qaeda and prevent the Taliban and prevent other terrorist organizations to use Afghanistan like they used it before to plan the East Africa embassy bombings, to plan the USS Cole, to plan 9-11. Do we have a plan to do so? This is not a military uh, uh, decision. This is not law enforcement decision. This is not the intelligence community. This is a political decision. This is a whole government approach dealing with this. Um, as for the great power competition, you know, <laughs> there is significant overlap between both. Now we see so many countries around the world, to include Russia, to include regional powers like Iran and Turkey, using non-state actors to accomplish their regional missions. We, in the last 20 years at the United States, established significant amount of partnership with regional uh, groups, with local entities uh, to counter terrorism. And we cannot just walk away from these groups um, in order to follow a new strategy about a great power competition. The world is a messy place. It's not we can pick and choose. Uh, the world uh, operates differently, and we need to deal with the world as it is, not as some analysts in Washington believe it ought to be. Uh, I think you know uh, we have significant amount of threats to deal with today, and I think the counterterrorism a strategy of the last 20 years, uh, specifically the part of establishing partnerships and establishing, um, you know, uh, training relationships or engagement uh, with countries uh, around, uh, you know, the world is going to be very significant, um, you know, to, to help us even with the great power competition strategy.